could say that Hedrick Smith needs no introduction on this island, but let me uh, give you uh, some of his credits. I can, certainly can't be exhaustive. Uh, he was the Moscow bureau chief and the Washington bureau chief of the New York Times uh, and uh, shared the Pulitzer Prize during those years for the Pentagon Papers. Uh, he wrote a book called The Russians, for which he won another Pulitzer Prize, an unshared new Pulitzer, uh, and also The Power Game and Who Stole the American Dream, which is on sale in paperback and when you exit the, uh, the auditorium. Uh, the, Hopefully, uh, he'll, he, and he'll be there to sign copies after this event. Um, beginning in 1989, he left print and went into the television business. So he was a television producer for PBS and Frontline and did 26 primetime specials uh, and, and a miniseries, including two that won the Emmy Award. One of them, The Wall Street Fix and Can You Afford to Retire? So, which are very relevant to today's topic. Uh, which I will now give you Hedrick Smith talking on the great populist earthquake of 2016. I'm over here, Michael. I fooled you. I'm over here. Well, first of all, let me thank you for being here. It's a treat to see all of you, um, particularly on a day when the Seahawks are playing. It's nice of you to be here. And I just want to tell you how important and wonderful Orcas Island is to Susan and me. My regret is that Susan isn't here. This is a dash of mine out from Washington, uh, D.C. to Washington State and back in a very short order. Uh, so she couldn't make it. But we love Orcas. We love being part of this community. We love the Chamber Music Festival and Martin Lund's Jazz Festival and all the other activities, the sailing and the hiking and so forth that goes on here. So I feel very much I, I can tell you I would not have done this for any other place but Orcas at this moment. <laughs> and secondly, I want to thank Michael and the committee for inviting me because it's, a, it's an important topic and it's an important time. Michael's right. Six months ago, it's a long, ago, a long time ago in journalistic terms, I, I wrote a piece called The Populist Earthquake of, 19, of 2016. And we are looking at uh, and feeling the aftershocks and tremors of a populist earthquake. The election of 2016 is probably the most dramatic outburst of populist uh, backlash against the elite and against the status quo in this country since Andrew Jackson's election in 1828. It sounds like a long time ago, it is. Jackson, you may or may not recall, was a Westerner from Tennessee. He was an outsider. He was running against the establishment candidate of his party, President John Quincy Adams. And the issues of that election were jobs and trade and the Obama, what he called the tariff of abominations. And I believe that is the election in which the term political yahoos was coined looking at the people coming from outside. So if you feel as though you're feeling the, the earth shake and tremble, the same thing was going on back then. And what I want to do today, I'm going to go into the election a little bit and look at some of the numbers with you, but I'm not going to do what people have been doing for the last 10 days, parse the numbers in detail. What I want to do is use the election as an MRI on America and see what it tells us about the country, where we are, where we're headed, why it happened, and then maybe some of the stuff that may follow on and, and that you may or may not want to be involved in. And when I'm talking about the election of 2016, I'm really not talking just about the race between Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. I'm talking about the whole election, and that means three elections. There was an election in which Bernie Sanders, an unlikely 73-year-old fringe candidate who admittedly called himself a democratic socialist, which is usually the kiss of death in American politics, ran and won 21 states and 12 million votes and nearly toppled a sure dead winning nominee for the Democratic Party. That's a huge event in and of itself and it tells you something is rumbling some anger is churning in the belly of America. 
And Bernie Sanders tapped into it, and I suspect there are people in this audience who were very much moved by that man and by his cause and by the issues that he raised. And then we had a second election in which a non-politician presidential candidate ran against 16, 16 Republican rivals, most of them established politicians, governors of states, senators, whatever. And once again, absolutely, totally fooled the establishment politicians and certainly the mainstream media and most of the American public and won the nomination. And then we had a third election in which that guy ran against the establishment candidate and won. So when you have three elections like that going on, uh, just set aside partisan politics for a moment. It's telling you something really big is going on in this country. We're a really divided country. We're divided by money for sure. We're divided by power for sure. We're divided by whom we trust. Think of all the messengers that went out there and said one thing or another about Trump and whose comments were totally dismissed. Well, that tells you something about who trusts whom. And certainly the media uh, is mistrusted by a tremendous part of the American public, okay? And we're also talking about economic destiny. To me, the key issue in this election is inequality. But there's a difficulty. When we talk about inequality in this country, we tend to think of it in terms of inequality of income. But it's much more than inequality of income. It's inequality of power. It's inequality over the ability to help set the nation's agenda. It's inequality of being listened to in Washington. In economic terms, it's not just about the income you get, it's inequality of economic destiny. What do you expect? Where are you going? Where is your family relative to where you want it to be? Where is your family relative to where it was? And where's your family, particularly in the next generation, gonna be unless something has changed? All those things are boiling in this past year in this country. And they're still afoot. The, uh, the election hasn't changed anything. The outcome has happened, but we're now going to see how it plays out. And I maintain that unless we address the issues of inequality in this country, it's going to continue to roil the body politic. It's going to continue to upset both political parties, both the Republican Party, which is very divided in itself, and the Democratic Party, which is clearly very divided among itself right now. So this is the table that has been set. And then you stop to think, I mean, Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders didn't invent the populism and the rebellion. There was, of course, Occupy Wall Street and the ripples out were from Wall Street. There was the Tea Party Rebellion of 2010. So they're picking up for what's already happened and what's afoot. And then when you start to say, well, why, why did it catch fire? Why was there a prairie fire across this country? How did a guy like Bernie Sanders suddenly blossom as a powerful voice for so many people? And the answer is what was pent up, what was boiling inside the country. When you have, we look at opinion polls, okay? And the opinion polls will tell us that Obama's rating went down or went up. The opinion polls will tell us that um, um, that the Republican Party has, uh, has a bad rating. And the opinion polls will tell us Congress has a bad rating. The opinion polls that matter the most in terms of understanding our country are the ones that tell you people don't trust the system anymore. 70, 80% of the people in poll after poll over the last six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years have been saying the political system is broken. They'll say the same thing, Washington doesn't listen to people like me. Special interests have too much power. Lobbyists have too much power. There's too much inequality of income. The wealthy get what they want. I'm shut out. That's all working. Those things were being told to us again and again and again. I, mean, uh, I wrote this book, Who Stole the American Dream? It came out four years ago. <laughs> My problem as an author was I was too soon with the story. Uh, but it was there. The story was there to be told in the wake of the collapse, uh, the financial collapse on Wall Street in 2008. Um, this what's what's boiling, what's going on. Confidence in the American political system is at its lowest level in 40 years. 
There were polls that I saw that said 60% of the American people, I'm talking about, I'm talking about a year ago, I'm talking about two years ago, 60% of the American people said America is in decline. They didn't say, I'm worried about the party that's going to win the next election. They didn't say, what's going to happen to me? They said, the country is in decline. That is a major judgment. There was another poll, by the way, that followed that one that said 63%. So it wasn't like it was a fluke. So people are really feeling deeply uneasy about this country. John Gardner, who was Lyndon Johnson's Secretary of Health and Human Services, uh, later the Republican, by the way, moderate Republican, a breed we need a lot of in this country, um, a moderate Republican who founded Common Cause. And he wrote in about 2006 or 2007, we're walking the edge of a precipice. This is 2007, before the collapse, and he's saying, we're walking the edge of a precipice here. Civilizations die of disenchantment. If enough people lose faith in the system, the whole thing begins to fall apart. So it didn't take an election. It didn't take a financial collapse for somebody as discerning and as articulate and as caring as John Gardner to see that something deep was amiss. So what we're seeing in 2016 is a play out of that deep attitudinal earthquake, those deep fault lines. Typically, American elections are fought by polar opposites, left versus right, liberal versus conservative, Republican versus Democrat. This was an election, if you look at it all the way through, in which the line that divides us was horizontal, not vertical, not one side and the other, up and down. This was a bottom-up rebellion. This was people who felt left out. This is the forgotten against the fortunate. Uh, this is the worried against the well-heeled. Uh, this is people who left out against people who are doing really well. It's not, by the way, it's not the haves against the have-nots. It's the have-plenties against the have-not-enoughs. If you look at the actual statistics of the election, Hillary Clinton won majorities among the poor, families with income of $50,000 or less. The $50,000 and up, Trump won every group. But the really important group is the group from 50 to 100,000. This is the middle of the middle class. So these are not people who are desperate, but these are people who are feeling downwardly mobile and very pessimistic about the future. Okay? Now, if you, it, what's interesting is, and you can, you can parse reality in all kinds of ways. And what I'm trying to do here is to see with this MRI if I can help you, us, me, understand what we've just witnessed and been through and are still going through. If you look at the macro numbers, the economy has been growing. If you look at the macro numbers, We've created 15 million jobs in this country since the bottom of the recession, since early 2009. But if you look at the micro, and the other macro number you can look at, and this is an important number that has not been made much of, the average wage in 2015 went up 5.2%. That is a big gain, 5.2%. And those are all things that were being articulated by President Obama and by Hillary Clinton and by the legions of people who supported her. And they're legit, and they're an important part of the picture. But the problem is that the microeconomic picture looked bad to too many people. That even with 15 million jobs, even with economic growth, and even with a 5.2% pay raise, median household income, the income of the average family in America, right at the belly, right at the middle of American society, was lower in 2015 than in 2007, before the downturn, and lower in real terms than in 1999. Think about that for a moment. What that tells you is the average family in America over the last 17 years has been going backwards in terms of family income. Now, if you look at regular costs and adjust them for inflation, 
maybe they're sort of keeping up. But when you're looking at the big ticket items, when you're looking at healthcare, when you're looking at housing, when you're looking at college education for kids, they went through the roof. So the family that aspires to give its own family members decent health care, a decent education, decent housing, a decent future, is feeling very hard pressed and fallen behind. That is the reality. That is the reality we walked into as this election cycle began. Now, you can say, well, so change was bound to win in this election. Well, to a certain extent, that's true. Change was, was bound to win. Uh, my friends in the press love to say this is a change election. We've had a president of one party in office for two terms, eight years. If you go back and look at history, it's very rare the same party wins the third election for 12 years. George Herbert Walker Bush following two terms of Reagan was the last example we can see. Then you have to go back a long ways. Have to have to go back basically to uh, uh, to Franklin Roosevelt and Harry Truman. So that's true. It is it, it is uh, uh, it, politically there's a rhythm, there's a pendulum swing. But the realities I'm talking about are much deeper. They are much more permanent. Uh, they're seismic. They're tectonic forces. Uh, they're not sort of tactical, short-term political forces that you can sort of play games with and get around. No, these are forces that you have to deal with in this country. Um, I'm not going to go through a lot of election numbers, but I would like to share a few things with you that will help you uh, and me uh, make this a little bit more concrete to you. I wrote them down because I can't remember all the numbers. There are a couple of things that are important. <laughs> I wrote a bunch of pieces, not only the one, I, when, one that Michael mentioned about the earthquake long six months before the election, but I also wrote a piece about voters and voter turnout. Um, I don't know, about three months ago, 41 million eligible voters in America are, were not registered. I don't know if you know what the turnout was uh, on November 8th, but 57% of, of people who were eligible to vote, not necessarily registered, but eligible to vote, voting age citizens, 43% of the people who could have voted in this election didn't vote. 43% of a couple hundred million people, we're talking about 80 million people didn't vote. So the non-voters voted, right? They voted by not voting. That tells you something about where we're going, what we need to do, okay? Now, in terms of that, Hillary Clinton won the popular vote and her margin is increasing because there are absentee ballots still being counted in California and in Washington state and a couple of other western states. Um, her margin uh, in the popular vote is about 1.4 million uh, higher than Donald Trump. She's at about 63 million, he's at 61.6. But even with that, at 63 million, Hillary Clinton had more than 6 million fewer votes than Barack Obama in 2008. 6 million no shows. Six million, that is absolutely huge. And when you start to look at the states that mattered, there was, there was a turnout turnoff that's really critical. And I believe it's related to this angst, this anger, this resentment against the, the establishment, this feeling that the system doesn't listen to me, that it's not working for me, and there's no point in my getting involved. And these are not just kids, and these are not just stupid people, okay? What's interesting is if you look across the six states that made the difference, start, <laughs> I've got to look at the map from your side, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Michigan, Wisconsin, Iowa, Florida, okay? But if you look, it's right across the belly of the country. Now in the decade of the 2000s, we lost 56,000 factories, 56,000 plants and industrial installations closed in America. They're all over the place, California, Texas, Florida, Oklahoma, okay, but huge chunks of them were in Pennsylvania, Ohio, Michigan, Wisconsin, to a lesser degree, Iowa. Okay, so these were places that were hurting, these were places that were unhappy, these were places that were the center of this populist rebellion that I'm talking to you about and that we need to be aware of. 
What's really interesting is Donald Trump, the latest count, and of course the count changes a bit, but the latest count is that Donald Trump won Wisconsin by 27,257 votes. I checked this morning, okay? Michigan, Donald Trump by, won by 13,107 votes. Pennsylvania, Donald Trump by, won by 71,800 votes. 112,000 votes total. Had they gone the other way, those states would have gone the other way. Hillary Clinton would have gotten 46 more electoral votes and wound up with a total of 278. So when I'm talking to you about the belly of America and the importance of political attitudes, political turnout, and economic and social experience in those areas, I'm telling you where this election turned. Were there other factors? Was race a factor? Uh, was there prejudice? Did uh, Comey's letter make a difference? Yeah, all those things played in. But you can see the pivot. It's like a teeter-totter. You can see Barack Obama won Pennsylvania, Ohio, Michigan, Wisconsin, Iowa, and Florida. And Hillary Clinton lost those states. Okay? So that's telling you. And a lot of the things that happened there happened in other states as well. What's interesting is in terms of turnout, turnout in some urban areas, which tend to be heavily Democratic, went down wasn't as high as it had been four and eight years ago. And turnout in rural areas went up. Wisconsin's a really interesting state. Uh, Milwaukee County, which is where the city of Milwaukee is and which is a Democratic stronghold, the turnout was down by 60,000 votes from last year. Now remember, I told you Trump won Wisconsin by less than 28,000 votes. 60,000 more votes in Milwaukee County probably would have carried Wisconsin, okay? Now, what's interesting about Wisconsin, and this tells us something about America, it's just really fascinating. There are par large parts of Wisconsin, and I'm indebted to a guy named Craig Gilbert, who is the Washington bureau chief of the Milwaukee Journal, is a friend of mine. He did, looked at this in detail. There are parts of Wisconsin that voted for Obama. And those same parts of Wisconsin voted for Trump. And those same parts of Wisconsin voted for Scott Walker, a rabidly conservative Republican governor who is anti-government and very pro-business, and for Tammy Baldwin, an openly lesbian Democratic liberal senator. Now, I don't know what that tells you, but what that tells me <laughs> No, but what that tells me is these voters are casting around for some agent of change. They don't know where to go. It's not an ideological vote. It's not a racial vote. It's a vote saying, we got to do something different. And I will try Obama, and I will try Trump, and I will try Scott Walker, and I will try Tammy Baldwin. It's an effort to try to treat this all as though it's, it's a racist conspiracy or it, it's, it's all native. Those factors are there. But I'm talking to you about the pivotal counties in a pivotal state, which is similar to the pivotal counties in other pivotal states, and the voting record there. And the voting record says to me, this is a country in turmoil. This is a country that's deeply divided. This is a country that is not necessarily ideological one way or another, but will throw itself uh, in the arms of what looks like an agent of change and won't be quite so driven by uh, party label. Now, is it true Republicans went home and voted for, Ray, uh, for Trump? Yes. Is it true that most Democrats went home and voted for Hillary Clinton? Yes. But the turnout numbers tell you it's very important who actually showed up and who actually voted. And, uh, and in these areas, uh, what was driving people was this urge for change, this idea that somebody different, somebody apart from the establishment, somebody from the outside, somebody who is, is speaking against the status quo and, you know, uh, taking a risk. I don't know whether or not this person's going to deliver, but I know that it isn't what I want. And specifically, Trump overwhelmingly won the vote of the discontented. 
He won 79% of the vote from people who said the economy was not good, not great, not fair, but poor, 79%. He won 78% of the people whose family economic situation is worse in their estimation today than it was two years or five years ago. So these are people who are downwardly mobile. They're not saying it's terrible, but it's worse. And he won 69% of the voters who said the country is headed in the wrong direction, and those accounted for 63% of the whole country. Now, what happened was that, that Hillary, <laughs> the whole Republican establishment, the mainstream media, all missed this. Hillary never campaigned in Wisconsin. She never thought it was necessary to go to Wisconsin, not only Hillary, but all the people around her. So they failed to read what was going on. The warning was, was um, Bernie Sanders' primary victory over Hillary Clinton in the Democratic primaries, that the Rust Belt Midwest was not a place that Hillary Clinton could take for granted, which is what they did in the general election. And that hurt them pretty badly. And the difficulty, of course, for Hillary is that whatever she said about policy, she was seen as the voice of Wall Street. I mean, Bernie Sanders must have said it umpteen times. Why was she making $600,000 speaking fees, speaking for Wall Street banks, and she doesn't want to make the speeches public? So the case for Trump among lots of these people was made before we got to the general election. Those were deep set problems for lots of the people out there. Uh, and, and he took advantage of that in spades. My point is not so much about them uh, as candidates, but about the attitudes and the forces that were at work. Um, and what it says about America. Um, I've spoken here before, and I hope those of you who heard me will forgive me if I repeat, but I'm drawing back to Arnold Toynbee who was a famous man when I went to Oxford after Williams College in the 1950s. And Toynbee wrote a study of history that studied uh, uh, human civilization, 21 civilizations over 6,000 years. And Toynbee's interested in the way civilizations rise and fall, what causes civilizations to grow, to flourish, to endure, and what causes them to begin to wither and wither away, collapse and, and fade uh, and disappear into the ashes of history. And he talks about um, the challenges and responses of various different civilizations. He sees that the evolution of human history is that of challenge and response. And um, he starts back with the Inca civilization in South America and the Egyptian civilization along the Nile. And he says the challenge they faced was an environmental challenge. There was a question whether or not they were even gonna be able to establish an agricultural economy that would sustain a human civilization in a relatively small area. And he said they overcame that challenge and we know they did well because they had the extra wealth and the extra human uh, power and ingenuity to be able to build the famous temples at Machu Picchu and along the Nile, the pyramids and all the temples up and down the Nile. So we know they were successful, but they succumbed to another challenge, which is the challenge of an external military invader. In the case of the Inca civilization, it was the Spaniards, and in the case of the Egyptians, it was the Ottoman Turks, and they fell before that. Well, that's the kind of challenge we in America can understand. We re respond to, we relate to. We did it in World War I. We certainly did it in World War II. We met the challenge of Hitler. Uh, and then in the Cold War, we met the challenge of Soviet communism around the world. So we met that challenge. But the two civilizations that we most admire and draw our examples from, indeed, even build our political temples to in Washington, are ancient Greece and ancient Rome. And Toynbee says they fell victim to what Toynbee calls schisms in the soul of the society. Schisms in the soul of the society. Schisms in the body social. We would call it schisms in the body politic. What he means by that is internal divisions that become irreconcilable and the civilization can't deal with them. In the case of the Greek city-states, they became, got into internecine warfare and they gradually withered and lost power and the Hellenic civilization rises and then you get Rome. And in Rome, it starts you know, with, with, with Caesar and Brutus and then the fight with Pompey and it goes on. Even while, even while Rome is expanding, the internal divisions are gradually weakening Rome from within. So when the Huns come, they can take over because 
it crackles. Ladies and gentlemen, this is where we are today. This is where we are in America, in my estimation. We have schisms in the soul of the body politic. We have schisms in the society. We have internal divisions. And our ability to survive, and looking around this room, there are a fair number of people who are either my age or close to my age. So as we think about our children and our grandchildren, and younger people, as you think about your lives and your children, and think ahead, we have got to deal with these schisms or we're gonna to continue to have the kind of roiling, upsetting, earthquake election that we had this year. I'm not making a prediction about the 2020 election or the 2024 election. I'm telling you what, what lies ahead for America over the next decade or two, unless we deal with this, because we have way too many people in this country. We're talking 50, 60, 70 million people in this country who feel shut out and unable to do anything about it, and therefore they will take a desperate chance to try to change things. Now the question is, what is it? How do we change it? What do we do about it? And the typical answer is, well, we got this inequality of income uh, because of globalization, because of technology. Uh, it's sort of inevitable, suck it up, get used to it, middle America. All those 56,000 plants, they were due to go. And the trouble is, there's an element of truth to that. There is hardly an industry uh, in America that hasn't been hit by globalization. And you've had companies shut down and plants shut down and communities shut down, by the way. Because a lot of these places, particularly in rural areas where you saw this very negative vote uh, towards Clinton and very positive vote towards Trump, uh, they lost the only plant within 20 miles of a lot of people's houses. And they lost the good middle class jobs that went along with those. And, but I think it's a half truth that's dangerously misleading. And the reason I think that is that there are a couple of reasons. One is, We've seen manufacturing in this country decline uh, from being about 19, 20% of the workforce. And those are great jobs. Those manufacturing jobs are great jobs. They pay 22, 23, 24, $25 an hour. They come with good health benefits. They come with good retirement benefits and so forth. And the people who lose those jobs and have lost those jobs wind up in jobs working at Walmart or in retail with some for 10, 11, $12 an hour. Now the statistics show, and I just gave them to you, 15 million new jobs. But those people are moving from jobs at $25 an hour to jobs at $10 an hour. They don't think they're well off. They don't think they're well off, and they're right. Okay? So that happened here. Well, inevitable. At the same time that was going on, we went from 19, 20% of our workforce in manufacturing in 1999 to 8 or 9% today. Huge loss. Five, six million jobs. At the same time, Germany kept 21% of its workforce in manufacturing jobs. At the same time, Germany and Germany's industry raised the pay of the average German worker five times more than the average American multinational corporation. Now, the answer we were told is you can't possibly afford to do that and be globally competitive. Okay. What's interesting is during the decade of 2000, we had a $6 trillion trade deficit while we were holding the wages down and while our manufacturing sector was shrinking. We had a $6 trillion trade deficit. We bought $6 trillion more stuff from the rest of the world, mostly China. And Germany had a $2 trillion trade surplus. So it is possible in today's world for a manufacturing, modern, high technology economy to have both high wages, a large percent of the workforce in manufacturing, and deal well in terms of global trade. And we did that for a long time in America. We had a period in America where we had shared prosperity. If you go back to the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, um, we had increases in productivity of almost 100%, 97% over a 35-year period. And the average, the median hourly pay and benefits of the average worker went up 95%. What's interesting is if you look at the Trump voters, the ones that are most skewed towards Trump are older. Some of those actually may remember a period where when the economy grew, they actually saw their standard of living go up. And the answer is, in the last 35 years, the productivity of the American workforce went up 80%, and the median hourly pay and benefits of the average worker went up 10%. So 
So during, we had a long period there where prosperity was shared, and we've had a long period since then where prosperity wasn't shared. So the reality that you're seeing played out at the voting polls and the ballot booth, ballot box, is reflecting the reality that's actually been happening over time. And these people haven't seen the vehicle until this election, although they tried with Obama in 2008, as I said before. So there is a changing economic reality. How is it possible that we had shared um, prosperity in this country? Is it possible to get back to shared prosperity? Is there a way of doing that? Well, if you go back and look, as I did before I wrote the book, Who Stole the American Dream? What I found was two things mattered, ideas and power. The idea we had at that time among the industrial leadership of this country was that shared prosperity was smart business and smart economics. If you paid tens of millions of American workers well, they went out and spent the money. Americans are not big savers. I mean, we save to buy our homes, and we save a bit for retirement, not very much, and we save a bit back, particularly back then, uh, for, for college for our kids. But we spend 95% of our income, and in bad times, we spend 105% of our income. You know? <laughs> but, but the point was, they went and spent it. And if they spend it, they drive demand. Demand forces companies to expand production, build new plants, hire more people, uh, buy more equipment, push the economy to grow. It's called the virtuous circle of growth. If you pay high, you get high demand. You get high demand, it pushes high growth. Those things go together. There's a circle that works together. So that worked during that period. And then there was also a period, and this is very relevant to you, to me, to us today, we had a period where Americans were deeply involved in politics. Yes. People were involved in civic movements. Uh, my first uh, uh, brush with it was in 1960 when I began to cover the, the civil rights movement back in February 1960 when they began to have the sit-ins and then the freedom rides and then I was in, in Birmingham, Alabama and then the March on Washington. There were blacks pushing, we want in. They didn't want a revolution, they wanted into the American dream. And then women started saying, it's not fair for us to be paid 41 cents on a dollar. And Betty Friedan wrote The Feminine Mystique. John F. Kennedy in 1963 uh, signed the first piece of legislation that moved towards not gender equality, but better gender treatment in the workplace. We're still not there, but there was a whole women's movement. There was a consumer movement. Ralph Nader wrote, unsafe at any speed. Uh, talked about how GM, Ford, the American car makers were making cars with defects, causing accidents, people got killed. Sound familiar? We had 26 million cars recalled last year for defects because some of them had caused deaths. But the point was, Nader triggered a, a consumer's movement, and we got pressure uh, on, the, on the government, on the Food and Drug Administration to check drugs better, on the Agriculture Department to check meat better. It was, there, was a, there was a movement that mattered. Here in Washington State, uh, the biggest issue probably is the environment. In fact, some of the people who were down in Seattle uh, were, were people who helped organize Earth Day. Uh, Earth Day 1970. Earth Day 1970, 20 million people went out on the streets, went to college campuses, uh, went to Congress, went to the mall in Washington, went to state capitals, went on the radio, went on television. 20 million people said, clean up the air. Clean up the water. This is outrageous what's going on. There was engagement, okay? And believe it or not, you know, in, in, in one year, Congress passed seven pieces of major uh, environmental legislation. A clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, Clean Drinking Water Act, Safe Drinking Water Act, Anti-Toxic Substance Act, on and on and on. And all of them except the Clean, Air Act, uh, clean Water Act were signed by Nixon, a very pro-business Republican president. And the and majorities on Capitol Hill were enormous. I mean, the votes were like 90 to 6, 89 to 11, um, 72 to 3. I mean, huge. It was, this was not a partisan issue. And Bill Ruckel's house comes from this state. Uh, he was the first head of the EPA, a friend of mine, Environmental Protection Agency. I said to Bill, I said, what's going on here? I mean, Nixon gets aboard. What's happening? He said, the people have spoken. People are engaged. We're in the government. We've got to respond to people. So, Civic engagement mattered. We had, this, we had the Vietnam War. We had the anti-war movement that had an impact. So I'm talking about a whole bunch of movements on a variety of different issues. It was common back then, and there was an interplay, and the sharing of power between Washington and average people, and the communication worked a lot better. 
And then we began to move in another direction. We had a revolt of the bosses. Uh, they began to fight back against the populist movements. Uh, the business got organized. They began to build the lobbies. Uh, even before Reagan gets into power, uh, you know, there, there are 10,000 registered lobbyists for a business uh, in response to a letter from a guy named Lewis Powell, who was a corporate attorney later put on the Supreme Court by Richard Nixon. But the point is business got active. And they started to fight against the unions. They started to fight against the consumer movement. And they began to move large lobbying forces to Washington. And they began to change the, the, the landscape of power in Washington. And at the same time, we began to move away from what, what, what used to be called stakeholder capitalism, where the CEO said, it's my job to balance the economic interests of the various different stakeholders, the workers, the, the owners, the managers, the towns we operate in, the banks that loan us money, the customers we have, which is what people believed back in the heyday of the middle class. Uh, Charlie Wilson, CEO of General Motors. Reg Jones, CEO of General Electric. Uh, on and on, I can cite a half a dozen of them. They believed that it was smart economics and it, they believed it was their responsibility to share. And now we move to a period of shareholder capitalism where, where the belief and what's taught in American business schools is you have one function as a CEO and that's to deliver maximum return to shareholders. Give everything you can to the shareholders. And yeah, if you have to pay workers more, you have to have new products and so forth, yeah, that's fine. But your object is to return maximum share to, to, to uh, maximum return to shareholders. There's an economist at the University of Massachusetts named Bill Lazonic. He did a very interesting study that got published in the Harvard Business Review a couple of years ago. And what it said was, he went back and studied. This is really important. He went back and studied and said, what was happening? What was generating the kind of economy that I just described to you where you had shared prosperity. Back in the 50s and 60s, the Standard and Poor 500 companies, which is what he analyzed, 500 of the largest companies in America, used to split their profits roughly 50-50 between their shareholders and reinvesting in their business. Actually, it was 53% to shareholders and 47% to research and development of new products, to moving into new markets, to retraining their workers and to giving their workers more money. Fast forward to the decade of 2010, what Lazonic found was the Standard & Poor 500 companies returned 91% of their profits to shareholders and spent only 9% on R&D, growth into new markets, worker retraining. That's the formula for a disaster. And it isn't just Hedrick Smith who's telling you that. Larry Fink who is the CEO of BlackRock, a $4 trillion investment fund on Wall Street, the biggest fund on Wall Street, last year wrote a letter to 500 American CEOs and said, you are killing the economy, you are killing the growth of your own company, stop coddling your shareholders, plow more of your money back into growth. Okay, so these are some of the economic facts that lie behind the revolt that I've been talking about. In fact, there has been this shift. There is absolutely nothing in globalization. There is nothing in modern technology that says you spend 91% of your income and profits on yourselves and your investors, and only 9% on growth. That's one of the reasons why we have slow growth. It's one of the reasons why most companies don't have very good retraining programs. For the workers who get thrown out of work or whose skills fall out of date because there's new technology, it means we have to shift back. We have to invest in growth again. So now here we are. What do we do about it? What's Trump going to do about it? What are we going to do about it as a, as a people? Because these are the issues we've got to address. We can't simply... <clears throat> Excuse me, we can't simply just wring our hands and say, oh my God, the other side won, this is gonna be awful. I mean, I look at the appointments and I'm as shocked and concerned as you are, okay? But we're in a country that needs fixing. Mm -hmm. So is there anything he said, anything that's been done, anything on the table that gives any hope or deserves our support and consideration? Now, contrary to what Trump said and the holes that I pointed out in the economy, he actually, unlike Obama, who inherited a total mess from George Bush, 
Obama has actually inherited an economic tailwind. I'm sorry, Trump has actually inherited an economic tailwind from Obama. We have had growth. We have been creating jobs. We did get a 5% wage increase across the board, including many of the people who are unhappy that I've just been talking about. And the chances are they're gonna get another one this year to which Trump will have contributed nothing but for which he will claim total credit after the fact, okay? But there's also a chance that he might do something good. I don't know if you saw this morning, uh, Trump said something um, you know, very nice about the, uh, the incoming uh, minority leader of, of the Democrats in the, in the Senate, Chuck Schumer of New York. Um, that's not just a little bit of politics. That's suggesting maybe we can start to deal. Obama, uh, Trump, I keep saying that. Trump, I can't get used to thinking of him as the president. So. <laughs> So Freudian, Freud, an honest Freudian slip that keeps happening. Um, Trump has said, in fact, he got the idea from Hillary that he is going to put a trillion dollars into rebuilding the infrastructure of America. The highways, the bridges, the roads, the railroads, the ports, the seaports. It's a great idea. It's been kicked around for the last decade. It's been necessary for the last decade. Obama has been trying to get the, the Congress to do it, but of course, being a Republican Congress and his being a Democrat, can't get it done. It's just possible that Trump, being a Republican, can get the Republicans to go along. He's sure as heck going to get Chuck Schumer and the Democrats to go along. So there is something. I mean, actually, having a jobs bill, rebuilding the infrastructure, could actually begin to deliver something, both to the country as a whole, but particularly to the constituents that have bet on him and hope that something good is going to happen. That's something he could do. Uh, and I think there's a reasonably good chance it's going to happen. Secondly. He could do something about the minimum wage. Um, he has danced around that issue, sort of hinted he might support a $15 minimum wage. The closest I could find was a statement put out by his spokesperson in August saying he supported a $12 minimum wage, which is a little bit below what you just voted for here in Washington State, $13.50 an hour. But nonetheless, he supported that. He said the state should basically do it. If he did that, that would make a difference. Next thing he said is really tough. He's going to revoke NAFTA, he's going to revoke our trade agreements, and he's somehow going to make new bargains uh, for the workers. Um, sounds nice, tough to do, and the difficulty is he can't bring the jobs back. They're already gone. We lost about, figures I've seen from the Economic Policy Institute in Washington, suggests that we lost about six to six and a half million jobs to Mexico and the Pacific Rim over the last 20 years through a variety of, of trade agreements. It's been a long time for the mainstream economists to come around. EPI has been saying this for quite a while, not those numbers, but that we lost them. Most mainstream economists resist that, but they're starting now to come around and acknowledge, yeah, we lost two or three. They got different estimates, but they're coming around to it. Um, but what will really be interesting is to see whether or not Trump, who believes in jawboning, talking, putting pressure on people, striking a deal, whether or not he will actually make a difference in specific circumstances. You may recall that uh, during the Indiana primary and during the primaries in the Middle West, he made a huge noise about Carrier Corporation, which is in Indianapolis, moving a plant, 1,400 jobs, from Indianapolis to Mexico. They make furnaces, they make air conditioning equipment. And Trump said, if you do that, I'm gonna slap a 40% tariff on anything you bring back from Mexico. But one of the things we need to do is to see whether or not, in fact, he does that. Whether or not, in fact, he can turn around companies like Carrier. Uh, not sure that he can get the laws through quickly, uh, there are lots of people in Congress who believe in free trade. Paul Ryan, the speaker, is one of them. Uh, but simply the threat, public threat, coming from a president uh, like Trump, who is tough and vindictive, um, it's possible that there will be some people who will back down. There are people who will watch that. Uh, there's something else that might actually help the economy in terms of jobs, and that is we're about to see the biggest Republican Keynesian economics from the White House we've seen since Richard Nixon and probably bigger than Nixon. Trump is talking about a huge tax cut, mostly for the wealthy, and I'll get to that in a minute. Huge tax cut, big spending, a trillion dollars over time on infrastructure, and uh, more spending on defense. 
Well, that's going to be deficits like Ronald Reagan. Reagan was famous for deficits, or should have been famous for deficits, but in any case, he did have a lot of deficits. They were very big until the ones that Bush left Obama. Uh, and so that is part of what's exciting Wall Street today, the notion of deficit economics, fiscal policy driving growth. So that could happen. Now, that could wind up by being short-term gains, and I'm not a real good economist, but the economists I read tell me it could work really nicely for a year or two and then wind up kaboom in the next economic collapse. Uh, so that might. But to me, one of the real tests is going to be whether or not Trump is just talking the talk or whether or not he's willing to walk the walk. He's told and gotten the votes of 61 million people with the promise and the suggestion that he's going to reduce the economic inequality in this country. If he proceeds with the kind of tax cut he's talked about, and by the way, he's, he's thinking about eliminating the estate tax entirely. The estate tax is paid today by 0.6% of the population in America. It is only people who live and have money way the hell up in the stratosphere. And for some reason or other, there are a lot of average people who think it would be really good if they got rid of that. But um, uh, I, I've not been able to figure that out myself. Um, but if he does that, and he does the tax cut that he's been talking about, and the economists that I read say that if you're in the 0.1%, that means you make $3.7 million a year or more, lots more, you will get a tax cut of about $300,000. And if you make about $50,000 to $80,000 a year, you'll get about $1,100 tax cut. And not only the numbers whopper joy, but the percentages on income are whopper joy. So if that goes through, um, you wonder what it's going to take some of those folks out there to wake up. Um, so <laughs> I'm sitting and waiting. I have a mixed uh, evaluation of Trump's potential. He can do things that will make a difference to the middle class and the issues that have been driving this uh, political season. But there's also a grave risk that he won't, he won't do enough of them, and he will do other things that will counterbalance that. So that then begins to throw responsibility elsewhere. If you don't get it done in Washington, you're going to have to get it done in Washington, I, this Washington, in the states. So now, one of the things that's crucially important is voting rights. Some of the places that had low turnouts, or lower turnouts than four or eight years ago, Ohio, Wisconsin, Michigan, North Carolina, have had very restrictive voting rights laws passed in the last four or five years. And that had an impact. So one of the things that people were concerned about, a balance of power, fairness for the middle class, and I'm trying to be nonpartisan here, but if you happen to be concerned uh, with the Democratic Party, one of the things that people need to work on in this country is voter registration. When you have 43%, 80 million people who are eligible to vote and they don't vote, then you've got a very serious problem that we need to address, okay? And voter organization. Then, I mentioned infrastructure. On this last election ballot, there are over 40 measures in states for infrastructure funding. In California, I don't know whether there was one in Washington State, but all across the country. So states are starting to move. The states are starting to do something about college education. Bernie Sanders has been talking about free college education for everybody. But believe it or not, in Tennessee and in Oregon, the legislatures passed bills for free community college tuition. It's also being picked up and talked about in Texas and in Mississippi. My point is that when you sort of throw your hands up and say nothing can happen, don't do that. It is actually happening. So there's investment in infrastructure and jobs, there's investing in people. Some states are recognizing that if they're going to keep uh, uh, factories and modern technological companies in their uh, environment and, and within their borders, they're going to have to t put money up to retrain workers. The workers, particularly workers who are in their 50s who, who've got a good job record, who are used to a good standard of living, but who, who were trained in analog technology and, and not digital. And they've got to be retrained from analog to digital. That has to be done. All kinds of telephone workers and lots of others. So there are things that can be done at the state level. And the, I want to leave with the idea of reform. I never can fail to talk about political reform. 
You add a ballot measure. One of the things we have to do is make American democracy work better. People are right that we have a busted system. People are right to say that gerrymandering is tilting the results of, of 85 to 90 percent of the congressional districts in the country. People are right to say that big money is dominating our campaigns. You had I 1464 in Washington State this year, a ballot measure to put limits on campaign donations, to expose dark donations, and to give uh, democracy vouchers, $100 democracy vouchers to voters in order to offset the power and influence of big donors. And it failed, narrowly, but it failed. Guess what? In South Dakota, a red, red, red state, it passed. It passed against the Koch brothers coming in and spending hundreds of thousands of dollars to defeat it. Now, if that can happen in South Dakota, it can happen in Washington State and Oregon and lots of other states, and you can go back and do it again. In Florida, I was just in Florida, the Democrats picked up seven, eight, nine maximum. There's still a couple of seats that are in question. They only picked up a few seats. Three of them came from the state of Florida. Why? Florida enacted the toughest gerrymander reform law in the nation in 2010, a Tea Party year. It, got, it says in the Constitution of the state of Florida, listen to the words, you cannot redistrict the election districts of the state, quote, with the intent to favor one party over the other, unquote, or to keep incumbents in office. It is a standard for the nation as a whole. The federal constitution doesn't have anything that tough. The Republican legislature totally ignored it, engaged in a clandestine, unconstitutional gerrymander. It took five years of fighting in the courts to expose it. The state Supreme Court ordered the districts redrawn, eight of them. When you redraw eight, you probably wind up by redrawing 15. And in three or four of those districts this year, more competitive districts, voter choice. The black former chief of the Orlando police force, Val Demings, a black woman, won in his seat that had previously been held by Dan Webster, a Tea Party Republican. Stephanie Murphy, a young uh, Asian-American Rollins College economics professor, ran against John Micah, a 12-term Republican congressman, and narrowly beat him in the, in the district north uh, of Orlando. And there are a couple of others. I'm not going to go into details. But the point is, these things can happen. Ladies and gentlemen, we cannot have the kind of schisms in American society and not recognize that not only is our economic system, but our democracy is in danger. And we can't look at that and say, oh God, it was awful. I'm gonna take 90 million volumes or something stronger and retreat. <laughs> this is a time, and Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, a bunch of others are saying, this is a time to re-engage. But we have to re-engage intelligently understanding that most of us who are fortunate enough to have been educated uh, with higher degrees of education. Most of us have been fortunate enough to have good, steady jobs. Most of us who have an economic destiny uh, that we can look forward to that is positive need to understand more about the folks who have been left behind and focus our efforts at trying to help them. Now, lots of them are black and Hispanic. It is true, and we need to work for that. And lots of them are women, and we need to work on that. But lots of them are white males, and we need to work on that too. We need to commit ourselves to make this place work better for more people. That's the message of this election. And the people who failed to get it are not in office. And the people who heard the message and either used it and exploited it for their political and opportunistic advantage or actually intend to do something are in charge. But those of us who care about this country and those issues, we need to get involved and get active. Thank you.
I'm, I'm sure you all have a lot of questions, but first I'd like to give the microphone to our state senator, Kevin Ranker. He's going to give us his reactions, his uh, perspectives on the same phenomenon, and maybe ask the first question. Thank you, Michael. Uh, let's have another round of applause for Hedrick, but also for the committee. This is yet one more example of why we live in such an amazing place. Uh, I want to give a couple comments about how everything you said impacted us here in Washington State. Uh, and, and then I have a question that I think gets to the heart of something that a lot of us have been thinking about, which is how fearful this administration is to us on the social side. Um, so in Washington State, well, let me back up. Uh, and I'm glad this is be filmed because as a uh, state elected Democrat, I think I need to say this. I think our party and the Republican Party turned our backs on middle America about 30 years ago, and we haven't looked back. I think that uh, Trump went into Michigan and Pennsylvania and other places and lied and said, I'm going to reopen the mill. You're going to get your jobs back. And as you said, those jobs aren't coming back. But he said it, and that's what they wanted to hear. Hillary came in the next day, and actually Bernie said the same thing, came in and said, well, I have to be honest with you, but those jobs aren't coming back. People don't want to hear that. But he just, they just said, those jobs aren't coming back. And then they said, then they said to a 60-year-old you know, uh, person who had full benefits and a $100,000 a year job, um, not only are those jobs not coming back, but I'm going to send you to a vocational school for two years with a bunch of 18-year-olds, and you can get trained as a computer programmer. Um, that doesn't work. And uh, Hedrick, you said something that really was powerful for me. Uh, you said a lot of stuff, but one thing I want to repeat, inequality of destiny. Inequality of destiny. It's not just that people had a hundred thousand a year job with full benefits and now they're working at Walmart. So yes, they're showed as employed, but they're underemployed. But it's their destiny, it's their dream, it's what they dreamed of for themselves and their kids is shattered. And we haven't recognized that. We haven't recognized it as a Democratic Party. We surely haven't recognized it as a Republican Party. And, and on election night, I, re I remember everybody saying, well, Hillary's going to win because we've got the blue wall. And then and some of the folks in the media were saying, well, there's some, there's some cracks in the blue wall. Well, let me tell you, there was no blue wall. The blue wall melted about 20 years ago. And um, I, uh, I gave a speech about four years ago at UC Irvine down in California. And it was to all the, the top kind of environmental leaders both uh, from the nonprofit sector and from universities and from uh, other institutions. And uh, they asked me to give a speech on how to convince politicians to do the right thing by the environment. And my speech was titled, If You Can't Feed Your Kids, You Don't Give a Crap About Salmon. What I meant by that, you, Maslow's, <laughs> Maslow's hierarchy of needs says very clearly that as a human being, if you want to become self-actualized, which is like Yoda floating on a cloud and you're really happy, you need to start at the bottom. The first thing any of us need is food and water. If we don't have food and water, we don't care about anything else. The next step is shelter. If I don't have shelter, I don't care about anything else. The folks coming into my office, and Hedrick, edu uh, uh, environment is critical here in Washington State. I'd also say education is. So folks come into, into my office, if they can't feed their kids or they're worried about keeping a roof over their head, it is a luxury to care about the environment. It is a luxury to care about somebody else's education. And so where I've come to and where I think many of us have come to and frankly where we need to move toward as a state and as a community is really getting back to how do we not only cherish and love and respect our own community, but how do we make sure that our leaders outside of our community actually recognize this phenomenon and actually do something about it? Um, and uh, a couple things that I want to touch on. One is how this election impacted Washington State. We were very set in the state Senate to flip the Senate. So the Republicans right now have a two-seat majority. We were looking like we were going to pick up four seats. We picked up one. You want to know why? The same phenomenon that hit Pennsylvania and Michigan hit Washington State. The one seat we picked up was Mercer Island. Very well educated, uh, you know, high wealth and so on. In Seattle right now, there are more cranes than any other city in the United States. We have more development going on in Seattle than anywhere in the United States. Compare that to Aberdeen. Compare that, compare that to Wakayakum. 
most of the communities in rural Washington feel like Pennsylvania and Michigan. So the one seat we picked up was in an economically well-off place. Um, the seats that we didn't pick up that we thought we were going to, they were in eastern Clark County and other places just like Pennsylvania, where we haven't seen the job growth, where we haven't seen an impact. And in fact, there are four counties in Washington state, Wakayakum, uh, uh, Grace Harbor, Pacific, and uh, Mason County. I got the cue. Uh, <laughs> they have never voted for a Republican president in their 110 year history of being incorporated, and they did this year for the same reasons we lost Pennsylvania. So I believe we all need to wake up and we need to start looking and remembering that yes, it is the economy is stupid, but in Washington state, we also have a long history of actually really deeply caring about one another, loving each other and treating each other with respect. And so while we all need to wake up to the economic lessons, I think we also need to wake up and realize that some of these things are going to be under attack and we need to fight like hell to protect them. Choice, equality, justice. These are issues that matter to us. So, in the election, um, the same states that voted overwhelmingly only eight years ago for the first black president ever, this year voted for Trump. And I find it hard to believe that those same people that celebrated and rejoiced the first black president ever being elected, eight years later became racist, xenophobic, homophobic people. And so, I believe, and I want your opinion on this, are we in a place where the country will stand for the social attacks that came up in this election? Or is it purely about the economy and the general population will come to a place where they recognize that following that language and that hatred is unacceptable and un-American? Well, uh, it's a critical question, Kevin. And it seems to me that you can't, when you look, and I didn't mean to, uh, suggest in my comment that you can ignore the social issues, that you can ignore the racism, the comments he made, uh, uh, Trump made about uh, the wall, about uh, Muslims, uh, about disabled people, and so forth. It seems to me the response of the country has to be, if you go in the direction of healing the economic inequalities, if you move towards policies that are gonna do that, we're with you and we're behind you. And if you move in the direction of becoming repressive towards minorities, if, if, you, uh, if, you, if you go further in the direction of suppressing voting rights uh, and civil rights and so forth, uh, then you're gonna run into active opposition and people have gotta be ready to engage, whether it's engaged with lawsuits, whether it's engaged with marches, whether it's engaged on Capitol Hill uh, to fight it at the state level. I mean, I, I think um, nobody knows how to read Trump. Okay, none of us know how to read Trump. He's totally unpredictable. Um, but uh, there is a chance he can learn something. Uh, I, I mean, I, the, the meeting that Obama had with Trump, the fact they went from 15 minutes to 90 minutes, the fact that uh, Trump came out and said he wanted to meet with the president again, we'll see whether or not he does it. But the fact that he said, you know, there are parts of Obamacare that I think are valuable uh, and so forth. And now, by the way, he's not talking about a wall. Now he's started to talk about a fence. I mean, th <laughs> there, no, I, I mean these, things, these, things are, these things are not unimportant, uh, you know. And so I, I think it's a matter of you know, go this way and you've got a green light. Go this way and you've got a red light. And, and the country has to respond that way. And there are good reasons. Uh, for people to be concerned. I mean, his first picks in the area of, 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 of national security. I mean, Jeff Sessions as the Attorney General for an awful lot of people is a frightening figure. I mean, he was turned down by Congress when he was nominated by Ronald Reagan as, for, for a federal judgeship on grounds that he was racist. He made racist comments about, about white attorneys who were defending, working with the NACP, said you're a disgrace to, the human, to your race. Um, astonishing things, and he's already made some comments about mistrusting Muslims. So those things people have got to respond to, and I, I think people are. Um, you used a great word, and I meant to use it during my talk, wake up. Wake up both to the potential for good and for bad, but wake up and get re-engaged, and wake up on the issues that I was talking about. We can't coast anymore. Coasting has led us into an explosion. Let's take a few questions from the audience. Uh, wait until I bring the mic up to you. First of all, thank you. Thank you for your analysis 
And thank you for being here because we need that for healing. Thank you very, very much. As an American, I came to this wonderful land 40 years ago by choice. I wish I was born here. <laughs> I wasn't. I came here because this wonderful, graceful society. And I'm disappointed. Let me go back to various things, to a few things that you said, which I totally agree with you. There is a big confusion about the notion of power and notion of strength. You can take my power, I can take your power, but you can never take my strength. This society, this country has forgotten that strength is much more powerful than power. We have forgotten that we can change things not by seeking power, but by our own strength. One, two, I get so concerned about people when talk about reality as truth. I cannot change my truth or your truth. I can change reality, co-change reality. And every time we think there is something happening in our society as truth, we are in deep trouble. Truth cannot be, cannot be changed. Reality can be changed. Now, let me just thank you for your comments. Uh, they're certainly in harmony with what I was saying. Thank you for your insights. Um, about the infrastructure spending Trump has proposed, I heard it was going to be private investment and bridges and highways would it be toll um, infrastructure. You know, one of the interesting things about um, other societies, particularly Germany, to use an example, uh, that uh, we could learn from is that they work on a lot of their uh, global economic competition, whether they're building strength at home infrastructure or trading abroad with trade fairs. They put public and private together. Now, what's interesting about Trump is that as a real estate executive, he is used to that mix of public-private funding. And Obama tried to propose to the Congress uh, that there are currently something like 2.5, 2.6 trillion dollars of American corporate profits overseas. And we could let them bring back those profits to this country. They're avoiding taxes over there, right? And they don't want to pay a 35% corporate tax rate. Maybe we could give them a 20% corporate tax rate if they would promise to invest that money in infrastructure development. So you, and then you need public money as in, uh, loan guarantees, often as the initial funding to start projects. So that public-private combination that has been used very effectively overseas and which has been almost religiously resisted by economic conservatives in the Congress in both houses is something that Trump might actually be able to sell. So that's gonna be a very interesting exercise to see. But the public-private combination has clearly been successful in other countries, and we used to do much more of it. Under guys like Eisenhower and Nixon, Republicans, pro-business, and in more recent years, the Republican Party, in Congress at least, has become ideologically opposed to that. Uh, this is where some of Trump's unpredictability could turn out to be a positive factor. I don't know whether that'll work, but it's a potential, it's there. And the fact that he said something nice about Schumer, and Schumer happens to be on board in a public-private infrastructure idea, suggests that maybe that kind of bargaining is just, is, it may be hinted at, it may be a faint, it may be a fake. Or it may be the start of something serious. I don't know. Thank you. Uh, hello, neighbor. Hi. I thought this would be a good time to uh, invite you down for some Fox Bay oysters if you're going to be in town. <laughs> Got to do it. That'll do it. Okay, well, that'll keep you around. Well, that's good. I'm glad to hear it. Uh, Hedrick, uh, in the last week, the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal have both done an in, uh, extensive analysis of the Trump stimulus plan. And they have concluded that it is fool's gold. 
They have looked at it in detail and determined that it is not a Keynesian priming the pump by spending money on projects and hiring people. It consists almost exclusively of giving tax credits to existing corporations who switch their projects to so-called U.S. projects. And by the switch, the investors in that company and the principals are enriched substantially. Both papers reach the conclusion that there will be little, if any, job creation by the Trump stimulus. So my question is, if that happens, how does that figure into your political mix at this point? Well, the answer is, if that's the way the plan is carried out and enacted, then it won't have, it won't have the effect of, uh, of, of helping reduce the inequality of income. It won't generate jobs, so forth. I mean, they've done the analysis. I find it hard to believe that, that uh, Trump is going to be able to get other people on the Hill on board with that. He may well succeed with House Republicans, but he's going to have a much more difficult time in the Senate getting away with that. And if that's what the game is, I mean, if it's basically a shell game, then it's going to be up to the, the media and the opposition to expose it. I mean, I, I, that's part of what's going on now. I mean, I've, I've been rather cautious. My, my training as a journalist says, I can look at what he said, I'm skeptical of it, but let's give him a chance and let's see what actually unfolds. But if, if it works out uh, the way they said so, I have to say, I've read analysis in both of those papers, and it didn't come out quite as clearly as the way you put it. Um, um, so I'm not entirely sure exactly what you're reading, because I've, I've seen some other pieces in those papers. But if it comes out the way you're talking about, it's not going to work, and it has to be exposed. Uh, and I will bet you there are going to be people on the Hill who are going to be pushing hard to make it go the other way. It's going to be very important to see who he puts in charge of some of the domestic agencies and who he puts in charge of domestic economic policy in the White House to see what kind of people we get. I mean, at the moment, we've got, he's, he's paying off. I mean, he's appointing loyalists. The only, and, and Rens Priebus is a loyalist, but he's at least a mainstream regular Republican. He's the only mainstream regular Republican at this point named chief of staff that, uh, that Trump has appointed. So we're gonna have to see whether or not he brings other people in. If it's as tilted in domestic policy as it appears to be in security policy, then I think we got a lot of worries. We had a question over there. Uh, Mr. Smith, and I also want to say thank you for being here. And also thank you for the many years of professional service to uh, all of us. Uh, to move a little bit from domestic to uh, a foreign policy, uh, relations with Russia, many of the people who supported the president-elect would har find it hard to embrace Russia. With your experience, how could that be reconciled, and what do you see as U.S.-Russia <clears throat> relations? That's a great, it's a great question, and it's a tough question. Um, first of all, with Trump, we, we still don't know whether or not um, what he says is rhetoric or whether or not it's policy. So we're gonna to have to wait and find out about that. It is clear that Vladimir Putin isn't waiting. Vladimir Putin is, was in there fast. First foreign leader to call him, has a conversation. The Trump people said, um, uh, he called to say congratulations. The Kremlin spokesman came out and said they agreed that American and Russian relations were bad, they need to be improved, and the two of them are gonna to work together. In other words, Putin is ready to jump ahead. Uh, Putin wants to get uh, the, the American and Western economic sanctions lifted. I, I, Putin is going to be extremely difficult uh, for Trump to deal with, and I don't think Trump has got any idea of how difficult and how devious Putin is. Um, and the question is, can things move slowly enough so Trump can get on some kind of learning curve that's going to give him a chance for dealing? You, you do recall that there was another uh, president who was Republican who said he looked deeply into the eyes of Mr. Putin <laughs> and he saw the reality and embraced him uh, and got taken for a bit of a ride himself. <laughs> Having said that, there is, a, there is a very difficult real strategy debate. Where are we on Syria? 
are there moderate, mainstream rebels capable of opposing and unseating the Assad regime? Or have we passed that point? Do we need to acknowledge that? And then enlist the Russians to get rid of ISIS so we can then begin to go deal with the rest of the Middle East on a different footing. And there are people who are not Trumpian and there are people who are not fools who vigorously debate that in Washington now. Um, I have to say, I don't have a high confidence in the new national security advisor to the president. So who is gonna be, and the guy has been picked for the CIA is extremely bright. Uh, Pompeo finished West Point at the top of his class, number one in his class, went on and got a Harvard Law degree. Right? He has been adamant and polemical against the Iranian nuclear deal, which I think was a good deal, and, and actually saved us at least 10 years on Iran not building a nuclear weapon during that period. The opponents all say, well, look what's gonna happen after 10 years. Well, look what was happening before we got it. It was already happening. He may wanna upset that, uh, he, he was certainly all over Hillary on the Benghazi episode, so he's combative. On the other hand, people in the agency talk about Pompeo as being a very bright guy who can learn. So in a lot of these instances, the question is, how much time are they gonna get to understand? And one of my other questions is, you know, will Obama and Trump continue to have conversations? I mean. Obama and company tried, not very effectively, but they tried to back these moderate rebels in Syria. Sharing that experience with Trump may be important. Obama's had lots of conversations and Kerry's had many more with Putin. Sharing some of that experience and, and knowing in specific terms when Putin said certain things and then didn't live up to them may be a very important part of the learning process here. But I have to tell you, I'm worried about it. On the other hand, we pushed, the, in the Clinton administration, and then in the George W. Bush administration, we pushed the Russians back to their own frontiers. We said, basically, we won the Cold War. Sorry, Ivan, NATO is gonna take over all of Eastern Europe. Now, you need to understand that for two or three centuries, Russian czars have regarded Eastern Europe, Hungary, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Bulgaria, not quite to Romania, the same way we regard the Caribbean. And when we pushed NATO up close there, and then we signed the Article 5 NATO agreement that says, if Lithuania is attacked, we're attacked, and we'll all go to collective defense. That really pushed the bear back in the cave. And so when he had a chance, and you had that revolt going on in Ukraine, and he, the bear could grab Crimea, he grabbed it. It was easy. He had short supply lines, we had long supply lines. He had a country that was willing to back him up going to war, we had a country that wasn't willing to back us up. So we have to face some of those realities that in some ways Putin has been taking back what he feels as though was taken away from them at the end of the Cold War. Now that doesn't mean surrendering Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia, but figuring out some other way to begin to draw the Russians back into some kind of pan-European security arrangement is very important. And we've been unable to get, around, get away from this deadlock we've had with them. Um, I don't have a lot of faith in Trump and so far in his people at being able to do that in a wise way. But we do need to do that. And they may begin to open it up. It's just that Putin, he just jumped the pond too and he moved the rook and the castle over. Uh, and I hope the guy who's taken over can understand why I better hang on to my wallet and my underwear. And, <laughs> I, I mean, it, 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 this is the kind of thing we could talk about for hours. It's a very difficult situation. Holding firm, but the most important thing is holding firm with Merkel, holding firm of Hollande in France, holding firm with May in Britain, not walking away from your allies, particularly until you can figure out what, what you want to do. And in terms of the Iranian nuclear deal, the Russians are a signatory. The Russians are a signatory to the Iranian deal. Putin doesn't want Trump to walk away from the Iranian deal. So were the Germans, so were the French, so were the British. But so the complexity of the world that they're now being thrust into compared to the rhetoric that's been used about it, it's just a vast gap. 
just a vast gap. Okay, we are essentially at the end of our question and answer period. Uh, Hedrick needs to go and sign books, but I'm going to give the last question to another illustrious Orcas Island author, Norm Stamper. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Rick. I am very, very worried, as are many uh, Americans, about the Supreme Court. Uh, and getting to the social issues that Kevin was talking about, marriage equality, reproductive rights, Citizens United, the list is, is virtually endless. Is there any chance in the world that the Republican-controlled Senate would deny Trump uh, appointments to the court that offend the sensibilities of a majority of Americans? Um, you know, my f the f quick answer is no, and then we can go to another question. But um, you have to understand, the Senate is now 51-49. So we're two votes, Republican votes, to switch, and we're the Democrats to say solid. There might, in fact, be a limit beyond which uh, uh, Trump can't go. I believe that's already at work, uh, not on the Supreme Court. But I believe as, uh, I mean, we've already had Rudy Giuliani say publicly and everybody's reported he wants to be Secretary of State. It hasn't happened. It's pretty typical when, the, the sequencing of rolling out the appointments in a transition is very significant. It's not just who gets elected, who gets selected, but at what, in what stage they get selected. And Secretary, you know, the Chief of Staff and the National Security Advisor is inside the House stuff is normally first. But Secretary of State is one you usually lead with. And it hasn't happened. I believe it hasn't happened because Mitch McConnell has told Trump, you can't get Rudy Giuliani passed and con confirmed by the US Senate. Um, I may be wrong, I haven't done any reporting on that, uh, but you already have Rand Paul, one Republican saying, I'm not voting for him. So you're now at 50-50, assuming that all the Democrats stay in line, right? How's Susan Collins of Maine gonna vote? Susan Collins of Maine was very clear about not supporting Trump. She's gonna be a difficult vote for Trump to get on a number of issues. He's gonna have to win her over. That's not something that Trump is used to having to do. So it may be, you know, I'm talking about other politicians. He's used to saying, well, they better be careful, I'll destroy him. I remember what he said about Paul Ryan when Paul Ryan wasn't on board. So I, I don't, my hunch is that within the list of 23 judges that, that Trump said that he was gonna pick from, there are probably two or three that would pass the Senate, in which case you're gonna get a conservative uh, you know, judge that passes the Republican Senate. Uh, then the question is how conservative and what's the court gonna do? So I don't think he can do anything he wants. On the other hand, I think he can get quite a bit done and the court is one of the areas in which he's gonna have the most flexibility. I mean, look, Mitch McConnell said, we're not gonna let uh, Obama pick this Supreme Court justice. We're gonna let the people decide. Mitch McConnell's gonna come back and say the people decided. We're gonna, this is one we're gonna cash in. So I think that's, I, to me, that's a done deal, and, and you've got to get into the quality. But that's where a, a, a guy like Chuck Schumer can come in and say, Mr. President, if you want to do this and you go this far, we're going to have a lot of trouble over here. Or your nominee for such and such is going to go through very difficult hearings. We're going to be dug in on this. Don't push us here. So uh, we're so early in the game. It's very impossible. It's impossible to say, but I think there's going to be a conservative justice picked to the Supreme Court just as you do. And I sadly would say the same thing to you over vodka, which I would happily share with you. <laughs> okay. I, I've been convinced to relent. I'm going to give one more question to uh, Lerner Limbach, who's the director of the Orcas Food Co-op and was our only uh, delegate to the uh, Democratic uh, National Convention. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Um, Hedrick, thanks for joining us. And I wanted to say that I really appreciate and I agree uh, with both you and Senator Ranker on the point of uh, the importance of people getting re-engaged. And uh, my question is for all the people in this room, 
what would you, uh, where would you direct them specifically to get re-engaged and also, you know, for people who want to help others get re-engaged? Well, I, I said I'm voting rights, gerrymander reform, public funding of campaigns, limiting, uh, I mean, fix the political system. Uh, it'll make a difference. I mean, um, there's an independent commission operating in this state that does the lines for the congressional districts, but it's set up with a neutral chairman who doesn't have a vote. Guess what? In New Jersey, when they set it up, they had a neutral chairman with a vote picked by the state Supreme Court chief justice. And that guy said to the Republicans and the Democrats, you both come up with plans. And the one that's fairest to the most voters, I will back. That is using the leverage of neutrality to move the whole system in a better direction. This is a state that prides itself on its progressive policies. We tend to think of Washington as being out ahead of other, other states in the country, and it is. But that doesn't mean we can't do better. On gerrymandering for congressional districts, more importantly, on gerrymandering for state legislative districts, the kind of districts that you were talking about, the kind of thing Kevin was talking about, the problems the state has over funding of state schools and a number of other issues are intimately connected with the failure of the political system to give the voters a really good choice in lots of districts. That's what gerrymandering is about, gerrymandering reform is about. It's not about turning seats from Republican to Democrat or the other way around. It is giving voters a choice. It is drawing districts that are sufficiently evenly balanced so politicians have to come out and actually compete, which leads to more sensible policies, which strengthens the middle of our system and moves us away from the extremes, which is where we are. Gerrymandering reform, the public funding issue that got beaten in the state, I can't believe it got beaten in the state, I-1464, and it gets passed in, in South Dakota. That's very important. Uh, disclosure bills, you had a disclosure bill that almost passed the Washington legislature a couple of years ago. Uh, it, it sort of blindsided the, the powers that be that are used to dominating elections with money, and they woke up belatedly, uh, but you couldn't get a petition drive really working here. And they're important things. So I, I would engage on fixing our democracy. Um, Washington State's got a good record on raising the minimum wage, starting to work on that kind of thing. You know, SeaTac first, Seattle statewide. I mean, that, that's, that's a good record. Keep working on that. But worker training is important. Compensating people who are caught up in international competition and their companies are failing, giving them a hand uh, to move forward into new technologies when they reach a tough spot. So I, mean, I think there are a lot of areas, but first of all, fix democracy. Fix democracy first here, and then take it to Oregon, to Idaho, to other places in the region. Make this place a model that other states can repair to, um, and show other states that it can happen. I mean, I'm, uh, that's what I'm doing. I'm going around talking to people about, about South Dakota, about Florida, about Arizona, about places you would never imagine would happen. So wake up, get engaged, Drifting has gotten us into an explosion. Thank you. Thank you.